While he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house. Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not be afraid. Only believe. And he permitted no one to follow him, except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tumult and those who wept and wailed loudly. Why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. But when he had put them all outside, he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying. Then he took the child by the hand. Talatakumi. Which is translated? Little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately, the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age, and they were overcome with great amazement. But he commanded them strictly that no one should know it, and said that something should be given her to eat. So I'm over here. I'm over here in the dark under this screen. You don't want to miss tonight, 5 to 7. It's free. Look at these cars. Wrecked cars have been brought in, and they've been in a crash. And so tonight... You go through a maze called the nightmare so that we can get everybody in heaven because we are going to scare the H-E-L-L -L out of people. Give them Jesus. So there's a huge maze. You're going to see what these cars are all made of. You don't want to miss tonight. There's over 100 cars, thank you, that participated in Trunk or Treat. Rain or shine, we're doing it. The jumpies, the concessions come and have fun with the people of God and then all the people that come that you invite. Everybody's talking about the end of time. Get them on the campus. Say good things. Thriller will be done twice for sure, probably three times in the auditorium. And you should see all of that. All of that's going to happen tonight. Everybody ready to have fun? I'm talking about being buried alive. Buried alive. It is very interesting in the story that Jesus is now being approached by a father of a daughter in which she is very, very sick. And we discover that, that Jesus is about to be approached not only to heal his daughter, but there's a tragedy that's getting ready to happen in the midst of a father telling Jesus what is happening to his 12-year-old daughter. When we talk about buried alive, it is a very interesting study to discover that people, people in the 14th century, 13th century, when the technology wasn't what it was today, that how they could tell if someone had died is they put a mirror up against their nose and their mouth to see if there was any sign of breathing. There were many people, many people before our new technology came about that actually died. And they buried, or excuse me, they thought they were dead and they buried them, but they were alive. There's account after account after account that happens. Un and, and this is so interesting that in the 1800s and 1700s, in fact, our very first president, George Washington, put in his will, when I die, do not bury me for three days. I just want you to make sure I'm dead. <laughs> Did you know that they had bells in the cemetery? The strings were connected to the bells and they were put over the graves in the cemetery and the string would go down into the coffin and they would put it on the hand of, they thought, the deceased or was supposed to be deceased or dead. And um, they would also put hoses down in, in the coffins area where they buried him because there was so many people that they had buried but they were still alive. Somehow, they couldn't detect that they were alive. And so, this is kind of humorous, but scary at the same time, in my opinion, that they would hire people who worked at the cemetery, especially at night. They would walk around the cemetery waiting for bells to be rung. How would you like to have that job for $15 an hour? <laughs> Walking through the cemetery, 
waiting for a bell to be rung, meaning somebody's ringing the bell six feet beneath. This is a, this is a fact that people were buried alive. In fact, in the case of September 1st, 1937, um, Mr. Hayes, Angelo Hayes, um, he, he took a joyride on his motorcycle and he fractured his skull. He was 19 years of age. After skidding out of control, he was thrown from the vehicle head first into a brick wall. The impact was so severe, his own parents were not allowed to view his body. When the doctors examined Hayes, they could not find a pulse. He was declared dead and laid to rest. Because he had an insurance policy, the insurance company because there was, no, there, there was no police report, there was no, uh, there was no real examination on his body, that the insurance company became very curious, and the insurance company wanted to make sure that he was dead. Well, let me show you. Watch this. A very substantial head trauma. Multiple facial fractures. That's odd. What's odd? This man's alive. Declared dead on Monday. Buried on Wednesday. Dug up on Friday. Back among the living by Saturday. Of course, the big question is, how did Angelo Hayes survive being buried alive for three days? Angelo was in a coma. The human body can survive with less oxygen when a person is in a coma. Your resuscitation, your heartbeat is suppressed so that the body can either heal itself or still function. And if they hadn't dug up Angelo when they did, well, that coma would have eventually ended in death, a more permanent condition. Angelo was very lucky. I mean, that's a million to one long shot that uh, it would just fall in place that way. And that oddly timed insurance policy Angelo's father bought? Just a coincidence. They do happen, you know. The dogged insurance investigators dropped their case right away. And in fact, they saved Angelo's life. You know, I've had a lot of time to think, and Dad, I've got this really crazy idea. After he healed, Angelo went on to create a special coffin with a radio transmitter in it that allowed anyone else that was unlucky enough to be buried alive to call for help. The story of his miraculous uh, recovery and resurrection made Angelo a minor celebrity, and he went on to live a long and prosperous life. So you see, a happy ending. A bizarre one, but a happy ending nevertheless. Buried alive. There's story after story. You can search out the stories. They're very intriguing. Jesus is standing there, a multitude of people, a father of a daughter that is dying. She is really dying, and he's desperate. He works at the synagogue. His name is Jairus, and Jesus is in a multitude of people, and he's ministered to them, and he gets to Jesus. Jesus responds to Jairus. Jairus quickly tells Jesus, my daughter, can you come and pray for her? She's 12 years of age. She's really, really sick. Jesus commits to Jairus and says, yes, I will go with you. Now, as he was about to turn to go with Jairus, which that was such a relief because she was sick and, what, and, and, and she was so sick that he, he portrayed to Jesus that she was going to die. That's how, that's how bad she was. Jesus then stops because somebody touches him, and this is where the story gets good, and that there was a woman who had been sick for 12 long years, and she touched Jesus, and Jesus stopped, and it seemed like he was ignoring Jairus after he committed to Jairus, well, go to your house right now, and I, I will heal your daughter. He stops and begins to uh, ask the question, somebody touched me, and there's uh, hundreds and hundreds of people around Jesus, but then Jesus knows somebody touched him with faith who believed that they wanted to be healed because the Bible said that Jesus said virtue left him, you know. So he, he, it looks like he neglects Jairus. Have you ever felt that way? You prayed, you believed God, and you wonder, God's got me on hold. Well, well, what's the deal, God? I need a miracle right now. Well, let me just tell everybody, denial is not a delay. 
that God is what he says, what he says he's going to do, he will do. So when the Bible says, ask anything in my name, I will do it, he will do it. Jairus is standing there, he's panicked, but it gets worse. Here's the story. The story in the Bible, fifth chapter of Mark, we lift these words that you heard today. And, and while Jesus is taking care of another miracle, after Jesus has committed to him, I'm going to go and pray for your daughter. Someone from the house, Jairus' house, he is, uh, he, he's well-to-do, he works for the synagogue, but he's well-to-do, well he's got servants, comes to him and says, Jairus, don't bother him anymore. She's dead. Your daughter's dead. We're not given the name of the daughter, but she's dead. Now, every father in here or every mother in here, that would be a devastating thing to hear that your daughter is dead, your son is dead. But you have just talked to Jesus, and he said, I'm going to come, and I'm going to heal her. He emotionally, he emotionally uh, goes into some kind of reaction that Jesus turns around, continues with this miracle that he's dealing with, who touched me, and he looks at Jairus, and Jairus says, it's all right, Lord. And have, you ever, have you ever felt that way? And I know you're not supposed to feel this way, but I felt that way. It's all right, Lord. Lord, I prayed. I asked you to do the miracle. It's too late. It's, it's over with. Uh, thank you anyway. We, I love you. I still love you, but it's over. And Jesus turns around to Jairus because Jairus has that kind of feeling and sentiments. And he says to Jairus, and listen to this because it's very important. These are two key words in which you need to live with every day of your life. He says, fear not and believe. That's very important in your life. Everybody shout it out. Fear not, fear not, and then say, only believe. So he does the miracle. He finishes up, and you can read the story on your own time about the miracle he was dealing with. Then he went with Jairus. Now, the first coffin that I'm going to show you, I'm going to get in it in just a minute, is the, is the coffin of, of where Jesus, where Jesus, he, he, um, he teaches us about death. This is a great, great story about death. So if they go in, the Bible says as he gets to the house, Jesus, the, the, the people are crying. Uh, everybody's uh, the whole block is there. The relatives are there. They're crying because the little girl is dead. Jesus steps up and says, she's not dead. She's just sleeping. Now, I'm going to tell you something. When you become a believer and you become a believer in what God says, you will understand that you cannot walk among the fearful. Because when you don't have fear... When you don't have fear, you talk different. You act different. And people who are fearful do not understand because you have no fear. People who do not believe do not understand why you believe. We're in a crisis here. Jesus says, she's not dead, she's just asleep. You must understand when it comes to death, let's talk about that for a moment. Because we dress up death, we flower death, we poem death, we, we try our best to make everybody feel good when someone dies. Jesus cannot stand death. Well, evidently, we're going to have to all read the Bible again. Jesus cannot stand death. If you don't understand what I'm saying, Ask yourself the question, why did Jesus come to this world? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Why did Jesus come to this world? Not only to save you, but to destroy death. Now you're getting the same man a little loud. When did death come on the planet? When did death enter the planet of earth? It entered into the Garden of Eden when the devil said to Eve, go on and eat this tree, you'll never die. He'll lie to you. He'll, Satan will lie to you. And he did, she ate, and death came in. What, what is death? Sin is death. The wages of sin is death. If Jesus comes to destroy sin, he's going to come and destroy death. 
I'm getting a few more amens. So let, me, let, let me tell you what I'm talking about. Let me make a real good point here. When they came to him and said, do you know John the Baptist is going to be beheaded? He's going to die. You're going to his funeral, Jesus? Jesus said, let the dead, bear, uh, let the dead bury the dead. And, and, and they looked at him and said, that's your cousin. He was a powerful prophet. You're not going to his funeral? Jesus had no time for funerals. When he got around a funeral, he usually raised them from the dead. He cannot stand death. He will not pet death. He will not cry. He will not cry. He does not cry and say, I feel so bad because you died. Death is something he cannot stand. He didn't even go to John the Baptist's funeral, and the Bible said that Jesus said there never lived a greater prophet than John the Baptist. I mean, he was a greater prophet than Elijah, Elisha. You got to understand that Jesus cannot stand death. The problem is, is we, the church, we don't understand it either. Because if we understood it, we would be excited. That when death walked in, we would say, oh, death, where is thy sting? Look at you, all of you. You all want to go to heaven, but you don't want to die this afternoon. I understand. But the fact is, is that we haven't preached it, we haven't taught it until we walk around with fear and we walk around with unbelief. Let me teach you real quick. I only got a few minutes here. On the first coffin, I want to tell you. I want to tell you about Jesus. In Romans 7, in the fifth verse, it says, for if we have been united with him in death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Sixth verse, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Eighth verse, now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. I'm not talking about physical death. I'm talking about when you come to Jesus, you die of your sins, he then puts resurrection power inside of you. Oh, I'm not getting enough, God, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm trying to get them excited about why you died for us, that when Jesus died for you, he not only died for your sins, but he died that you might have the resurrection power now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. This is what it means to be born again. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. And when you have Jesus in your life, death has no longer dominion over you. Oh, we're getting better here. We're, we're on this. Come on. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Quit obeying. Quit being fearful. Quit wondering, oh God, I'm going to die. Oh, the doctor said I'm sick. You will die when you're supposed to die. And if you take holy communion, the devil cannot take you out before your time. But if death should walk through the door, you're going to bury me alive. Simply because when you have Jesus in your life, you have resurrection power in your life. You should not be afraid of death. In fact, the Bible says, precious in the sight are his saints. When you are born again and death comes to you, it graduates you into eternal life to never die again. At funerals, we should absolutely have a shouting time with believers. Now, if you're not saved, if you're not saved, order a box and cases of Kleenexes. We need to cry and say, that's the last time we're going to see it because they're going to burn in hell. They don't have resurrection. They're not going to live. They will not be buried alive. But when it comes to the saints, the Bible says, precious in the sight of the saints who die in him. In other words, heaven rejoices and has a party because death has no dominion over me. I have the, re oh, help me now, the resurrection of the power of God. Jesus walks in, watch what happens. So he walks in, they're all crying, hey, she's not dead. Then the Bible says they begin to laugh at him. The Bible says she only sleeps. She only sleeps. 
you will have people laugh at you. People want to cry when it's negative. But when you start saying, I have resurrection power, there's about to be a divine reversal in my life. They will laugh at you. They will think that you're crazy. But if you're not fearful and you are full of belief, when God says something, you can count on it. And if he said you're more than a conqueror, if he says, if I am with you, what can be against you? If he says the battle is mine and not yours? Oh, can I get a few, can I get three more shouters? Three more hand claps, five more hand claps. All right, now watch. You too will have to get rid of the laughers. She's nothing but asleep. <laughs> you are absolutely crazy. And the Bible said, Jesus said, get out of here. You can't be in the same atmosphere of negative and be positive. One of us has got to go. And I'm not moving because I am not afraid. And I believe for the very best in my life. Do I have anybody else here today? I am not afraid and I believe. Jesus says, all right, get out. You're gonna, have to, you're gonna have to dismiss the people in your life because all they are is negative. And they laugh at your ideas and they laugh even at the, at the mysterious and the supernatural things that are gonna happen to you. But God's about to do something great. He says, get out. Get out, all of you that are laughing and don't believe. She's, she's asleep. And so she's, they got her on the bed and they're going to bury her, I guess. And Jesus says, nope, she's asleep. He brings the mom and dad real close and says, come here. Are you shocked? You shouldn't be shocked because where Jesus is, there is no death. Where Jesus is, there is resurrection. Where Jesus is, there is life. The Bible says that Jesus came to destroy the works of death. Do not be afraid. What about the second coffin? You know, the second coffin reminds us of life things that have died, things that we, we have buried. We buried our dreams. We buried, well, I'm never ever going to get out of debt. We buried lights right here. Yeah, thank you. We, we bury stuff. We bury our marriages. We bury our children. They're never going to say they're never going to be, they're never going to be successful. That's never going to happen to me. We bury stuff. But God has allowed your dreams, even though you bury them, they're not dead. Uh, I'm talking to somebody, you've given up. You said, this is not gonna happen. That's not gonna happen. And this has failed and, and this has been so bad. And it seems like everything. And so you have buried your dream. Right here, you, you buried it. You, you literally made a coffin. You said, I, I bury the idea that I will, uh, that I, you buried it so much that it's locked up. I can't even get into your dream. And, 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 and you, you bury it. You just say, you just say uh, I bury it. I bury my marriage. I bury my children. I bury the idea that they're going to be saved. I bury the job I thought I was going to have. I, I just bury it. I just, it's dead. It's dead. But you know what? God is full of resurrection. And you, you might think it's dead, but it only sleeps. I'm talking to somebody. Your money is sleeping. Your healing is sleeping. Your future is sleeping and you've given up and you buried it, but not God. He's full of resurrection. 
That's the second cup. Why? Let me show you. Let me show you. Let me, let me show you. Let me show you what I mean. You go to the fourth chapter, and there was a dreamer. There was one that God called and put the dream in him. And in the fourth chapter, to prove to you that some of you have buried your you have buried your ideas. You have buried your future. You, you have went through crisis and you just buried it. But I want to tell you that what you buried is just sleeping. The Bible says in the fourth chapter, there was a man. His name was Abraham. Listen to this. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him who he believed even God who quickeneth the dead. What's he saying here? Here's Abraham who God said, I'm going to give you a dream. This is the dream. The dream is you're going to have a son. That son is going to create a nation. And today we know it as Israel. It's going to be a big nation. More than the stars of heaven, more than the sands of the sea. Now Abraham buries the dream. Sarah, why? Because it's dead. They said it's dead. What do you mean? Well, Abraham was 100, Sarah was 90. And let me, let, me, let me get a little closer, try not to make me act like you don't know what I'm talking about. Help me here. There are children in the audience. You can explain later at the supper table or the afternoon meal. When the Bible says that they were dead, it meant that Abraham was 100 years old. He was dead. Dead, dead, dead. 90. Dead, dead, dead. No sex. That's all I'm going to say. That's right. Dead, dead. Dead. But what you consider dead, God can make alive. In other words... I'm talking to somebody, you have buried your dreams, you have given up on certain issues, you have said it's never going to happen in my life, but I'm here to tell you that God is saying it's going to come back, there's a resurrection, I am the resurrection, I'm going to get into that report of the doctor that's bad, I'm going to get into the report of the bank that's bad and that loss that you lost in that investment, God is already getting an idea to get into you his faith and no fear that he is already proclaiming that what has been stolen from you, the Bible says he'll give it back to you seven times more. Now, let, 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 let me, before I get in the coffin here on the, on the dreams that have died on you, the things that you have just said, it's never going to happen. Things that you said, it's just dead. Now, let, let me go somewhere else with you. In life, and it doesn't matter if you're born again or not, you're going to go through trouble. But for you that have Christ, you that have the resurrection power, the Bible teaches us that we're going to go through stuff. In fact, the Bible tells us that there are things that we go through that it, 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 we don't understand why we go through them. But the Bible says we will go through this stuff. And the Bible says, uh, it says we are troubled on every side. You're going to have trouble on every side, front of you, back of you. There's going to be trouble even if you're born again. But then the Bible says, do not be distressed. Then it goes on to say, we are perplexed. Oh, my God, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? But not in despair. Oh, it gets better. Watch this. Watch this. It goes on and says, persecuted, but not forsaken. People who have talked about you, people who don't like you, etc. But you are not forsaken because God will never leave you nor forsake you. Now watch this. You may even be cast down, fell off the wagon, did something that you shouldn't have done. But you're not destroyed. Look at all of it. You're still alive. You haven't been in a car wreck. You haven't been rushed to the hospital. No bullet has went through your body to destroy you. You may have fallen off the wagon. You didn't mean to do it, but you're not destroyed. One good amen right there somewhere. Now watch this. Watch this. Then he goes on to say in the same chapter, he's talking, about, he's talking about the resurrection power. He's talking about the power that we have in the resurrection of these things happening to us. He goes on the 17th verse and he says, 
For he says, for our light affliction, he's talking about all your problems. Every one of us got a problem. Everyone's got, but he said, for our light affliction. Now, right there, you want to stop God and say, now, wait a minute, Lord. Wait a minute. What I'm going through is not light. It's heavy. They're foreclosing on me. I got a letter yesterday. I got to go to court. You don't know what my son did. You don't know what my mom, mom did. You don't know what my father did. You don't know what they did to me over here. Why would you say that about me, Lord, that I'm just going through something light? Because God doesn't lie. Because he says these words, I would never put on you more than you can bear. So whatever you're going through, whatever you're going through, God says you can take it. But I want to give you a good word. This is God. What you're going through is only going to be just for a moment. I'm talking to somebody this afternoon, it's going to be over with. I'm talking about Friday this week, it's going to be over with. I'm talking about this is the month that's going to be freedom for you. Okay? Because the next verse says, while well, we look not at the things which are seen. We've seen what we're going through. We see the bill. We see the problem. We see the situation. We see the doctor's bad report. We see, 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 see. But at the things which are not seen, you can't see it. For the things which are seen are temporary. Oh, I want to tell the devil today I'm just going through a temporary situation. I want to tell the doctor this is just a temporary situation. I want to tell the banker this is a temporary situation. Oh, can I get anybody excited about you're in a temporary situation? And the things which are not seen are eternal. What you can't see is getting ready to happen. So what's this got to do with the burial? And what's it got to do with that I bury my dreams and the problems, et cetera, et cetera? Simply because things that you think are dead. Things you think are dead. And you buried them. And you're, you just said it's over with. This marriage is over with. My kids are over with. It's just over with. Better give me some light. If you can't run the light board, don't run it. Just give me some light. So how, how does the resurrection happen? How does the things that we've been believing for and we buried them, we just buried them. I just give up on being rich. I just give up on having a better job. I just give up on my investments. I just give up on my kids. I just give up on her. I just give up on him. I just give up. They, the things that you have believed for, you may think are dead, but they're just sleeping. Waiting for what? You know what they're waiting for? They're waiting for you to call them back to life again. Did it not say, call those things that are not as though they were. My money's coming. My, my healing's coming. Get up out of that grave. Come on. Come on, dream. Come on, house. Come on, future. Do I have anybody that wants to speak to their past, the things they've committed in the grave? Because your dreams, your dreams, they just been buried alive. And you have the power to resurrect them. Oh, somebody's going to get something in the mail this week. There's a, there, there, there's a good report. Somebody's going to get favor. Somebody's going to get promoted. Somebody's going to get their debt wiped out. Somebody's going to get a house. Somebody's going to get can I Can I get anybody excited about it? I'm going to speak it into existence. Don't you dare, don't you dare get in the car and start talking like a funeral service. Well, I don't know if it's going to happen or not. I know he said it, but you know what we're going through. And we need $500 here and we need $300 there. Quit talking like you're at a funeral service. Start, start talking and saying, I don't know where it's going to come, but God can supply all of my needs. Do you remember Peter? Peter was one of his disciples. 
It came tax time. He came to Jesus and said, Lord, we don't have, I talked to Judas, he's the secretary and treasurer. We don't have enough money for our taxes. Jesus said, oh, you don't? Okay, go fishing. Peter said, what do you mean go fishing? Go fishing. And don't even worry about the bait. Just let the hook down. It, it'll be fine. What are you talking about? Just tell you, Peter, go fishing because something's getting ready to happen in fishing that you have never experienced. And the Bible said he let the hook down and the Bible said they hooked the fish and when they got the fish up, the Bible said there was gold in the fish's mouth. I wish I could get somebody to go fishing today. Something supernatural is about to happen in your life. And you're not saying nothing. You're looking at me saying, boy, this is interesting. This is interesting. I'm not going to cry with you. I'm not going to burp you. Neither is God going to burp you. Neither is God going to hold your hand. He expects you to speak to death. He expects you to speak life. He expects you to speak resurrection. I just need one person to shout resurrection. Resurrection. What about the third coffin? Well, the third coffin is very interesting because the third coffin is the coffin in which, in which is your coffin. Now, we're all scheduled to die. We are all scheduled to die. We that die in the Lord, we that have the power of resurrection, we are the people who are buried alive. Oh, you may be cremated. For you that like to speed the process up quick, be put in a jar. You can do that. Not me. Let me rot, 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 rot one piece at a time. I just like the way God made me. There's nothing wrong with cremation. In the Bible, there's nothing wrong. So remember that we're scheduled to die, every one of us. There's an appointment time. None of us know that time, but we're going to die. Now, if you have Christ, you've been born again, you have Christ. And the Bible says, especially those that live in the last days, that if you die, especially in the last days, some, there's a mystery that's going to happen. And the Bible says, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. See, he didn't say die. He said sleep. Now, if you don't have Jesus... You died. You're dead, and you're going to go from one death to another death. But for you that have died in Christ, your body goes back to the ashes and the dust of the ground. But when death walks in the door of the hospital or wherever you are in the car accident, remember that God does not read death certificates. It don't matter how you die, especially you that are in Christ. Because when death comes, death gives you a graduation exercise and puts you in the world that you're going to live forever. Your soul and your spirit, it, it, it comes out of the body and it goes to be with him in the cloud of witnesses. And the only way you can get out of this world is through death. But when death walks through the door, you got to be able to say, Oh, death, where is thy sting? And you got to be able to say, Oh, grave, where is thy victory? Now, for, you, for people who died in Christ, they're asleep in the ground, in the caves, wherever they might be in the world. They get in. But here's the real mystery. If you die before the rapture, which looks like it's going to happen pretty soon, then one day the Bible says we all will not sleep. Jesus refers to it. Sleep. People who die in Christ, they're sleeping. You know how we sleep. We sleep, wake up in the morning. That's how fast time goes. This is the resurrection of the power of God. The Bible said when the rapture takes place, and that's going to happen before World War III and Friday, it looks like we just stepped closer to it. I was praying for peace and still in, but it looks like when we bombed Syria, we just got pretty serious. And the stage is set for World War III, and it's getting a little bit closer. And 
the rapture takes place because it's, it's got to take place before everything goes haywire. The Bible said there will be a sound and those that have died in Christ, they're just sleeping. They come up out of the grave. Or if they're in a tube being cremated, that'll be something in itself. The tube breaks and if somebody's in the room, they actually see, whoa, there you are. Boom, you're gone. Think about it. Let me tell you how powerful the resurrection of Jesus is. That Jesus, every time he was around death, he resurrected it. Do you know that? Resurrection power in him. And that resurrection power is in you. Whether you live or you die, we should all be excited about the fact, well, death, do you want to come get me? Is it my time to go? Oh, boy, this is absolutely great. I'm out of here. No more pain, no more bills. Oh, praise God, I'm going to have a new body. My God, I get to go and live forever. It should be exciting to you. But if you're fearful and you don't have un no belief, you're scared. You need another week. You need another vacation. You need another drink. You got to buy Jack today. You, you got to get drunk. You got to do something. Get your mind off. But if you have resurrection power and I die before he comes back, trust me, I'm just sleeping. Prophecies within the New Testament predict a period of extraordinary tribulation. Seven years of mounting calamities climaxing with the end of days. They foretell that we will experience unprecedented suffering and great cataclysms that may wipe out mankind. The rapture is the opening gun in a race to Armageddon that ends with Jesus and Satan battling for the souls of mankind. The rapture is both a terrible event, horrible event, undescribably horrible event, and also at the same time an undescribably thrilling, joyous occasion, depending upon which side one stands as an individual. If the rapture were actually to occur, would those left behind to face the horrors of the tribulation have any hope of survival? I'm not sure that it's possible for somebody to have much hope during the tribulation when their loved ones have gone when all these judgments are being rained down, when there's such chaos and terror. This will be worldwide. In fact, in one of the prophecies says that at one point during the tribulation, the entire world has an earthquake that levels the mountains and puts the entire earth on the same distance above sea level. According to some interpreters, the book of Revelation describes a chilling series of disasters they believe pandemics will wipe out millions. Climate change will bring scorching heat. A third of Earth's waters will be poisoned. There are a number of signs that Jesus and the Hebrew prophets and the New Testament apostles lay out that will be indicators that we are in the last days and that return of Jesus is coming. shall be a sound 
the dead in Christ shall raise up first. And we who are alive and remain shall be caught up in a fifth of a second, in a twinkle of an eye. Who has the resurrection power of God in your life here today? So you could die this afternoon, tomorrow morning, car could run into you, life could explode in front of you. 96 people die every single minute, so death is prevalent. But oh death, where is thy sting? I do not live in fear because I know who my resurrection power is. If you are walking in fear, if there is any ounce of fear in you, as they give me house lights, you will not go to heaven. Now there is a fear of the Lord. There is a respectful fear, but I'm talking about a fear. A fear in which gets you into denial, into unbelief. Remember what Jesus said to Jairus. He said, fear not, only believe. Say that with me, fear not. Fear not. Say only believe, only believe. The stage has been set. I wish I could say otherwise. Churches are breaking out with revival and people are getting saved by the thousands. Jensen Franklin called me and said, Steve, last Sunday night, we started with Perry Stone. We were only going one night. We've gone every single night. We can't even get the thousands of people off the street into the house of God. And we have went every single night. Something is happening. And now newscast is flying to, to Georgia, the explosion of revival. Let it come westward. Let it come westward. Because the curtain has been lifted. We are now seeing played out what has happened in the Middle East. Who would ever dreamed? But I got good news for everybody. I'm not fearing anything or anybody. And when everybody else is saying, what's going on? I'm saying, hallelujah, anyhow. Man, I'm not worried. I'm going to make money. I'm going to praise God. I'm going to have a test. Anybody got victory? By the way, you don't have a shout. The Bible said when it comes back, we will go up in a shout. You better practice your shout. And the Bible says, unto them that look for him shall he appear. I don't know if he'll come back this afternoon or next week or next month or next year. I don't know if we have five years. I don't know. I don't know. But you know what? I'm not living my life with chances. I'm living my life saying, Jesus, the resurrection power lives inside of me. Did anybody get a word from God here today? Shout a great big amen. I would like to do this secretly with you, this, the balcony, uh, underneath the balcony, and all of you in the cascade on the main floor. I would like to have a secret moment with you that I could sneak you into the presence of God and you could get your life right. But I can't do that. God has said, you're a man of God, you're a minister of the gospel. You better teach people if they're ashamed of me. Jesus is saying, if you're ashamed of me, I'm ashamed of you. And there is no such thing as private salvation in a booth or even in a church or at mass or wherever you go. God requires that you boldly come in front of everybody and say, I am not ashamed. I want the resurrection power of Jesus Christ in my life. Maybe you fell off the wagon. Maybe things are tough right now. Maybe you're not where you should be. Maybe you say, oh, I just need a touch of the Lord. It's all right. For God's sake, don't stand there and worry about who's standing next to you.
because they're not going to hell for you and they're not going to heaven for you. Your husband, your wife, your sister, your brother, this is about you. And today, all you have to do is say, Lord, I want that resurrection power. And he comes in and he takes the negative and the sin makes you heart white as snow. Now, this doesn't mean that you're perfect, but this means you're confessing that Jesus is Lord. And you're doing it in front of your husband, your wife, your mother, your father, your friend, because you're not ashamed. And that's the way Jesus wants it. Jesus says, I, I, I don't want them, I, this is not a private thing, Steve. I want them to be bold enough to let the devil and the whole world know. I want the resurrection power. If you're here today, maybe you're struggling with fear or doubt, or maybe your dreams you buried and you want to resurrect them, or maybe you need a personal encounter with the resurrection power of Jesus. And when people come today, if you need a healing, come. I believe that Jesus will touch you. And if you're here today, whatever it is, some will come for salvation, some will come to believe God that what they buried, their dreams, their future, that it will be resurrected by calling those things that are not as though they were. Some will come for healing. When I count to three, come, because I'm going to pray the prayer of resurrection. God's about to, how many can feel God in the house? God is here. He's here in a beautiful way. Don't be ashamed. Walk the aisles. Come down the steps and come to the altar. I'm going to count to three. Come. When I say three, and they will sing, and I will wait for you. One, two, three, come. Sing it. People are coming to the altar. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. The balcony is coming. Coming by the lines. Come, come. Join. Join the crowd. everybody and each other a great big hand clap. Look at all the people in the audience and everybody. Everybody in the audience. Everybody. Everybody that's saved. Stretch your hands toward the altar and say, God, God do miracles today. Do miracles. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Everybody lift your right hand before I I pray the prayer blessing on you. Thank you for coming. How many enjoyed the word of the Lord today? Next week, everybody, everybody will get a feather. And next week, I will be two stories up in the air. I'll be in an eagle's nest, and I'm going to make all of us eagles that we're all going to fly. We're going to fly higher than we've ever flown before. And if you come in here next week as a chicken, you're going to leave as an eagle. Bring your friends and family. Wednesday night, Wednesday night, I will be speaking on the subject, What is Next? What is next? Now lift that right hand up. Lord, I ask you to bless the people. Bring us back to the great celebration tonight and ministering to one another. And I ask you, Lord, that you would touch the congregation. Thank you for the worship. Thank you for the prayers. Thank you for their faith. Thank you, Lord, that they believe. God bless everyone and let them tell everybody about you while we have time. And everybody say in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Congregation may be dismissed, all of you on the altar.
Place your hand on your heart and say these words, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, I ask you. I ask you. If there is anything in my heart, if there is anything in my heart, it should not be there. That should not be there. Any sin in my life. I ask you. I ask you. Cleanse me. Cleanse me. With your blood. With your blood. For I believe. For I believe. You died for me. You died for me. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, I make you Lord of my life. I make you Lord of my life. Give me, give me the resurrection power, the resurrection power of the Holy Spirit. Of the Holy Spirit. I believe. I believe. You're going to give it to me. You're going to give it to me. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. He's about to heal all of you that need a healing. Now, this is the best way, everybody. This is how you impress God. I would ask you to lift holy hands because the power of resurrection is coming on you. Just lift holy hands like this. Close your eyes. Begin to say hallelujah or thank you, Jesus. They're going to sing it, and I'm going to ask God to heal and fill you with the Holy Spirit. See? Father, in the name of Jesus, receive the power of the Holy Spirit. The, the resurrection shall be free. Fear go. Unbelief go. Fill them with the power of the Holy Spirit. Me. Heal the sick. Heal the sick. Baptize every body with the resurrection oh. power of the Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit right now. I declare the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, come. Fill them with the power to heal hearts, blood. Thank you, Jesus. great big hand. Give Jesus a great big hand. Come on. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Everybody say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. For filling me. For filling me. With resurrection power. With resurrection power. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. For saving me. For saving me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. For healing me. For healing me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, what I buried, what I buried, what I buried, it's going to be resurrected. It's going to be resurrected. Your dreams, your money, God is going to give back to you what the devil has stolen. Come on, that makes you want to clap, don't it? Come on, God, come on. closing moments, I have a great admiration for all of you. All of you, all of you that boldly came down today, I have a great admiration for you. You had to break away. Evidently, you broke the spirit of pride. You came. God's going to reward you. God's going to bless you. Now listen closely. You're not perfect. When you get born again, you're not perfect but you have the power of God to keep perfecting you to get better. Say it with me, better. 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 And that's what that's about. So if you fall off the wagon, you get back up and you say, God, I don't want to lose the resurrection power. I don't want to lose. I don't want to lose my faith. I believe. So I compliment all of you. You're all going to be blessed. Today, if you'd like to be baptized, because it's very important you get baptized, you'll sign up on a card and we'll baptize you. If you'd like to join the church, man, we want you to be involved. If you have a special request, make sure I get it through one of the elders. Elders, lift that up. Elder, lift up your pad. Elders. And you write it down. They got a pen. They got a special card. If you'll give me that, I will 
I will really go after, we all will go after helping and believing God. Go get your healing and go out there and live life with no fear. God bless you. See you tonight or Wednesday night. Praise the one who set me free. Powerful, powerful word. Good, good, good word. Receiving that word. I just, I, just, I, just, I just am amazed that when God speaks, regardless who's speaking, re, when God speaks through someone, and that was such a good word, a, a word in which enlightens us, it, 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 it's revelatory. And if you heard something today and said, I believe that's for me, it was for you. And that is what you need for God to do the thing that you've been believing him to do for you in your life. Well, today, so exciting. I just, I just am so overwhelmed about you participating. Thank you for giving in the offering. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being a part. You're, we, we really feel like you are really family. Well, I want to tell you, Wednesday night's going to be great. You don't want to miss big Wednesday night. We love you. We thank you. And we believe. We believe strongly, yes, 